A few weeks ago, I started a new type of video. It's a question and answer video where I take questions that people have asked me in the comments of my videos and I answer them here in another video like this. So this is my second one. The response to the first one was so overwhelmingly positive, I figured I'll just do another one. Um, so remember, ask me questions because I can answer them later in another video. And just remember that this is all just my opinion. Um, so don't let anything I say really you know, upset you. It's just my opinion. That's all it is. So here's the first question. And the first question is from Efrain Sueldo. And I'm, yeah, I'm pronouncing that wrong. Hi, Mark. Are you able to capture the Osprey diving vertical at full speed with the Sony a7R IV? Thank you. Yeah, you can. It's the hardest shot of an Osprey to get, in my opinion. And here's a good example of a young Osprey, you know, moments before impact. I'll show you a couple more. Here's another. Um, look at that. Wow. The nictitating membrane is just starting to come over the eye. And here's a, another one, completely different bird. And I think this is my favorite, like, impact moment because it's the moment it just touched the water. Those back talons just barely touching the surface and that nictitating membrane down over the eye. Oh, wow. It's beautiful. So yeah, you can do it with the A7R4. So of the four cameras that I've used to shoot Osprey coming full speed vertically, I've done, you know, used four cameras that I like. I've used the um, Nikon D500, the Nikon D850, the Sony A7R4, and the Sony A9. And I'll put them in order of easy to hardest, in my opinion, I'm starting with the easiest first to get that shot coming down. And that's the hardest shot, I think, to get in Osprey photography is the moment before they hit the water because they're moving so fast. So the easiest camera to get it with is the Sony A9, no question. Um, I think the second easiest camera to get it with would be the Nikon D500. Again, um, just a little bit behind the A9 in, in that sense. The third easiest camera to get that shot with, I think, would be the Sony a7R IV. I think the autofocus system on it is really good. Nikon struggles when a bird or osprey where I shoot, when they come down and they hit the horizon line, Nikon always struggles with focus right around there. So the hardest camera to get that shot with of the four, I think, is the D850. Our next question comes from Pots and Oz Adventures. And here it is. I love Ola England stuff too, especially Will It Chug. Yeah, Ola seems like he's a really cool guy. Um, the question is, I'm shooting birds in flight with a D3300 and the 70 to 300 F4.5 to 6.3. Which should I upgrade first? Lens for say a 200 to 500 5.6 or body D500? I want both these items eventually, but not sure which one will bring the best performance gain, fun, shooting birds in flight slash feeding. That's a really good question. And the typical uh, train of thought of this is always invest in the best glass that you can have um, or that you can afford because you can usually take the glass with you. You know, it stays with you for the, the lifelong love of your photography. But I'm going to kind of go against the grain on this one and say that you might get a better upgrade from the D3400, I think it was, or 33, to the D500. The Nikon D500 is an amazing camera and its ability to shoot 10 frames per second and its focus is just, I think it will probably be a better choice for you because you're planning on getting the 200 to 500 anyways, but I think if you get the D500 and you go out shooting with that, you're gonna be really, really happy. So I think in that situation, I'd get the D500 but you need to get a better lens too. You really need to get that 200 to 500 as soon as possible. And this next question is from Suresh K. Volum. Mark, I really love your photos and the way you narrate your photo shoots and your videos. I have a question. You mentioned that you like to capture mostly handheld. I wonder how to capture both videos and photos at the same time. Do you use two cameras simultaneously or do you capture photos from some time and videos from some time and later edit your photos to incorporate edit your videos, I'm sorry, to incorporate photos, or do you have an assistant to help in all of your photo shoots? I saw your son in a couple of videos, but not sure if he assists you in all. All right, so to answer that question, a little bit of everything. Um, you can shoot and take stills at the same time with both cameras, Nikon and Sony. With Nikon, it's a little bit more challenging because the autofocus and video doesn't really work. So you have to hope that nothing moves forwards or backwards. So you can do a lot of panning left and right with Nikon video and, and do really well and then you know, move a rocker and then start taking pictures um, or vice versa. And then with Sony, it's a little bit easier to shoot video at the same time because you can really just press one button on the Sony cameras 
and start shooting video, press that button and you're back to photos and you can take photos. Sometimes though, it's best for me to go out and get some great photos and then come back with a dedicated lens and then maybe capture all of my video and edit it all together to tell the story. Sometimes it's also best to have an assistant with me. A lot of times my son will be out there with me and while I'm getting uh, photos, he's grabbing video and then we can edit it all in together like that. This question is from Gary Barton. Hi Mark, I enjoyed watching the video. It was very informative. He's referring to, I think the last question and answer video. Um, in the video you said you didn't like the 500, Nikkor 500PF F5.6. What was your reasons for not liking it? I was planning to buy this lens for the UK photography show to accompany my D500. All right, that's a, a tricky one because I honestly believe that I was sent a bad copy of that lens. So um, my initial experience with the Nikon 500PF was with a friend of mine, Michael. He let me um, use his for maybe, I don't know, 15 or 20 minutes with a teleconverter and I loved it. And by the way, this um, Michael, he's the guy that designed the fine tuning system for the DSLR cameras. So his camera setup was tuned perfectly. Maybe my 500PF wasn't. But when I used my 500PF, when I finally got one in my hands, anytime I took stationary pictures of something that wasn't moving, they were beautiful. But anytime anything moved, regardless of my shutter speed or aperture, the picture was a fuzzy, blurry mess. And there was nothing I could do to remedy that. So unfortunately, it kind of turned me off from the whole camera. Um, the still images that I got, they were good, but they weren't as good as my big Nikon 500 f4 as far as quality goes, and the render ability of the lens wasn't the same. And I'm happy carrying around a big lens if it means I get a better image quality at the end of the day. So that was my overall experience with that lens, and unfortunately too, at that time, I took that money from that lens when I returned it because it was no good and invested it in the Sony A9. So that's kind of how that all happened for me. This next video is from Jerry and SC. Hey Jerry, is that South Carolina or South Colorado or South California or I don't know. <laughs> if I bought a D500, which lens between the Nikkor 200 to 500 and the Sigma 150 to 600 S would be the better choice for image quality? Would 100 millimeters on the Sigma make much of a difference? I'm not a bird photographer, but really interested, thanks. For me, that's a pretty easy one. I would say Nikon any day over the Sigma and Nikon any day over the Tamron. Um, my friends at B&H let me borrow every lens in that category. That, well, I already own the 200 to 500, but they let me borrow the 100 to 600 or 150 to 600, I can't remember, Sigma, Sport, Contemporary, both Tamrons. And in my eyes, the Nikon was just way better in every way, shape and form. The extra 100 millimeters, I don't think you're really going to notice a difference. And this question is from Yuli, or I don't know, Uli. Um, I don't know, but hey, this picture right here, that is a really cool bird. This bird that attacked the other osprey, we nicknamed him Cheeky because he had a hook stuck in his cheek and he was very aggressive, as you can see in this picture. But here's the question. Hi, Mark. Thanks for another exciting video. I am using the D850 myself with the Nikkor 200 to 500 millimeter lens. Can you share your other settings on the camera with us? Are you using spot metering or integrated with focus on center? Hope these words are correct to describe it. What setting do you use for picture control on your D850? Do you shoot raw? And are these pictures out of cam or processed in Lightroom? A lot of questions I know. Thank you in advance. Regards, Yuli, Uli, I'm not sure. So that's actually really easy to answer all of those questions. I have a setup guide for the D850, which you can actually purchase. And I'll put a link to it here in the descriptions below. And I have a video that's basically the same exact content of that guide that's for free. And I'll put a link to that as well. That will answer how I use the D850, how I set it up, all of those questions in one failed swoop. Um, are the cameras, are the images straight out of camera or are they processed? Well, I shoot raw. So to take a raw file straight out of camera and share it that way, is kind of pointless, it defeats the whole purpose. So I do post-process my images because they're raw files. That's why you shoot raw files so you can kind of get squeeze a little bit more out of them in the post-processing process later. And this question is from Creon, I, I guess. Very nice explanation, thank you. Is there a reason you have selected zone as the main AF area? So this question references um, Sony cameras, probably the A9. 
I use the thumbstick for continuous shooting, but when I do that, I move the focus area zone around the screen. So what's the benefit to use zone instead of wide focus area? Thanks and take care. For whatever reason, I just get better results with the zone focus area as opposed to any other focus area on the Sony cameras. I really like it, I understand it, I know how to use it really well, and I prefer it over wide because it allows me to actually focus in a little bit smaller of an area where wide, I believe, covers the entire viewfinder. I don't want that. I, I want you know a smaller area that zone does. Zone is perfect. In fact, Sony, I think it would be cool if you could make a zone focus area, if Sony's watching, I don't know if they are, if you could make a, a zone focus, but an adjustable size. So imagine if, if you had your own area that worked just like zone, but you could adjust the size of it in camera. That would be really, really cool. So, hey, Sony, if you're listening, make an adjustable zone focus area so you can make it bigger and smaller. That'd be great. And this next question is from Daniel's Loose Ends. Hey, Daniel, you might want to pick up those loose ends. You might, you know, you don't want to trip over them. <laughs> I know, horrible joke. Okay. Hi, Mark. If my lens has a pan IS mode or image stabilization mode, should I use that for birds in flight or is it better to switch IS off completely at high shutter speeds like one two thousandth of a second? I'm finding my pictures are not super crisp. Love your channel. That's a really good question. And there seems to be a lot of controversy on that. Um, I think it really depends on the lens and the camera. Uh, really high res cameras like the D850 and the A7R4, you're probably better off turning off image stabilization if you're shooting birds with a fast shutter speed of say, one two thousandth of a second or more. So when I was shooting my D850 all the time, I left it on all the time because I did a lot of video at the same time and the image stabilization helped in the video. Um, on the A7R4, I actually turned it off completely and I think, if I remember right, I could be wrong, so don't quote me on this, I think Sony actually suggests that you turn it off and on some of the um, more expensive lenses like the 600 F4 that I have, I believe that when you put it on a tripod, there's a sensor that automatically turns image stabilization off anyways. So I'm more on the side that I think you should turn it off when you're shooting fast shutter speeds. I've gotten better uh, results that way. And this question is from Steve A. And this question needs a little backstory. So this question actually has to deal with um, my most recent trip to Costa Rica where I only took Sony gear and not my Nikon gear. And the question is, was there some reason for you using the Sony platform instead of your Nikon D850? And yeah, there was a reason I used Sony over Nikon in this instance. So the year before I hit Costa Rica and did Costa Rica with all my Nikon gear. And I really wanted to be able to take just Sony so I could use the Sony gear in a really challenging place. Costa Rica is very challenging because you're very much light constrained all of the time. So it really challenges your, you, your camera, all of your equipment. So I wanted to put Sony to the test of Costa Rica and then be able to compare it to the results I had the year before with Nikon. And that's why I took Sony um, and I was very, very happy with the results. In fact, I could be me just being, um, you know, evolving into a better photographer, but I got better results with the Sony gear in Costa Rica than I did with my Nikon gear the year before. And this question is from, I'm not even sure how you pronounce that, uh, something Thomas, you talk too much big mouth. Wow. Um, anyways, look at this picture. This is a really cute baby black neck stilt that I found um, just the other day. And somebody asked me, do birds spit? And it was, if this was spit coming off of the bird's beak, I don't know, actually. I think the bird was just, uh, had a wet beak and it was just shaking its head. Anyways, Really cute little bird and a good way to offset some negativity. And this question is from Martin Godwin. Hi, Mark. I have a two-part question related to one of your questions in this vlog and your earlier A7R4 setup video, which was so helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm really curious to know why you have why you use expanded flexible spot as your default secondary focus area rather than tracking, which I noticed you also have in your selected focus areas. Related to this, I have the A7R4 and here reports of difficulties with the Sony 200 to 600 tracking birds in flight on that camera. Can you share your experience on which focus modes works best or at least well for bird in flight with that lens? I realize you don't use the 200 to 600 much these days now that you have that 600 F4. Cheers. Um, the first question is a really common question. 
why I choose zone over tracking, and I answered it a little bit earlier on a, you know one of the other questions. The tracking works good on, on the Sony cameras, but for whatever reason, I get better results with zone. I found sometimes the tracking can be a little slow to grab that initial um, focus acquisition, and sometimes I might miss a shot because of it. With zone, it just does it instantly for me. Um, the second question, I just don't like my 200 to 600 on the R4. I don't think that it's an actual focusing issue. I just don't like the images that come out of it. I prefer the 100 to 400 on my a7R4, and I prefer the 600 f4, of course, on the a7R4. That's just an incredible combo. My lens isn't bad because I like the 200 to 600, and when I say my lens isn't bad, I mean the 200 to 600. I don't have a bad copy of it because I love the images I get from it on the a9, just not on my r4. And our next question is from Gold Horse. Amazing. What is the overall better camera in your judgment, A9 or A7R4? That's a really good question. In a perfect world, if you can afford both, I say get both of them because they're both extremely unique. They have their own um, advantages and disadvantages. So for me, um, I tend to like the A7R4 a little bit better than the A9 because I like to get really close to my subjects, to birds. Um, so with the a7r4 being 61 megapixels and mounting that 600 f4 that i have on the front of it the render quality of that lens on that sensor is just absolutely amazing at times i can crop in so far into an image and still get a usable image out of the a7r4 it's incredible if i'm in a low light situation i will choose the a9 over the a7r4 any day if i think i can fill the frame with my subject I think I would choose the A9 over the A7R4 as well. And that includes with the teleconverter, the 1.4 teleconverter, but I've only used that teleconverter on my big 600 F4 Prime. So I carry them both with me at all times because if I'm in a situation when I don't have good light, I'll use the A9. If I'm in a situation where something is a little further away and I have really good light, I'll use the A7R4. They're both great cameras to have in, the, in my bag um, because I can really cover everything with both of those cameras. All right, this question is from David Shaw, and it actually references the Costa Rica um, resplendent, resplendent Quetzal video that I did. If you haven't seen it, um, go check it out. Those birds are amazing. Here's the question. Hi, Mark. Great video and narration. Love the colors of the birds. Outstanding and so clear. Thanks for the post. Mark, I shoot the D850. If I were ever to go to Costa Rica, I would try and get the images or as close to as possible with the Nikon. What lens would you recommend? I have the 200 to 500 f5.6 and a 70 to 200 f2.8. Is there anything that would come close to the images of, of Sony, either native or third party, in your opinion? Sent with the greatest of respect, kindness of regard, and please stay safe during these strange times. You most definitely can get the same quality or caliber images from your Nikon D850 that I got from my um, Sony when I was in Costa Rica. Um, I would suggest if you go and if you're making that trip, try to get one of the prime lenses because you're going to really need some extra light up there in the canopy. So if you can get your hands on, say, like a 400-2.8 or a 500 f4, put those on the D850. You're going to get some incredibly beautiful images, just fascinating stuff. That's what I did the year before, and I loved every single one of them. So this video, I get the uh, opportunity to do things a little bit different, you know, not so serious all the time, a little bit goofy. You're probably wondering about the whole shirt thing. So all the shirts that I had on in this video are shirts that I've either made or my daughter has made. You can actually purchase them if you like down in the, in the description below. Um, they're done by Teespring and it should all be down there. Um, so it was a good way to show off all of these different shirts that we have. Um, as usual, let me know what you thought of the video in the comments below. Send me more questions because this is actually kind of fun to do. Share this video if you found it helpful. Hit the thumbs up and subscribe and all that good stuff. And until next time, I'll see you later.